Hi everyone and welcome to a video on the circle of traction. This is a really important concept to understand because it directly translates into understanding vehicle dynamics and that translates into understanding driving techniques and various mechanical and electronic traction aids. So let's get into it. Now the circle of friction is also called the circle of traction, the circle of forces and cam circle. It's all the same thing, that's what I'm going to explain now. Okay, so imagine we've got a tire and then we have this circle here. That circle represents the absolute limit of grip. Now we can use all of the tyre's traction for accelerating, or we can use all of that tyre's traction for braking. And then we can turn corners, we can use the tyre's traction for turning right, and we can use it for turning left. It's only got a certain amount of traction, and we can decide how we're going to use it. And so far I've just looked at accelerating, braking, turning left and turning right. So what if we wanted to turn as well as brake at the same time? Well this is what it looks like. We're using all of the tyres traction for turning left and now we're going to try and brake to the maximum as well. And here's how the circle of traction resolves that. We simply create a right angle um, here and then we draw a line from the centre of the circle to the edge of that right angle there and we find that the black arrow here representing the grip required actually exceeds the grip available as defined by the edge of that circle. So what that tells us is that we cannot actually brake at the maximum whilst turning at the maximum or vice versa. And you know that from driving a car, you know that if you're absolutely on the edge of braking adhesion then the car won't turn unless you reduce that, that braking. Um, and similarly if you're on the edge of cornering adhesion then accelerating hard or braking will send you into a spin or slide you out or something like, like that. So, so the, the circle of traction is really quite a good model for explaining that. So how do we fix it? Well, um, we're outside the grip li limits at the moment. What we can do is simply reduce the amount of braking, reduce the amount of turning, and then that brings that arrow back to touching the limit so we can do that. So we, there's the amount of turning we can do and braking we can do. Now here's another example. We've got a certain amount of acceleration here and a certain amount of turning right. So we're using some of the grip for accelerating, some of it for turning, um, but you can see that the resolved black arrow is not touching the edge of the circle and that means that we've actually got some grip we can, we can use. We're not driving uh, to the limit. So we can do two things. One is we can increase the acceleration and then that means that we're actually now using all of the available grip or we can leave the acceleration where it is and increase the turning demand or make a tighter turn radius here. Now of course this is momentary if you're continuing to accelerate etc then um, you're going to be demanding more and more of that but you see the point here driving techniques with the circle of grip really shows you how to manage that grip in a dynamic way and that's one of the keys, keys to successful driving techniques. So now let's look at something called understeer and how the circle of traction explains it. So when a car goes around a corner, the driver will turn the steering wheel at a certain angle and the car should follow faithfully that exact line doesn't happen, normally the car runs a little bit wide or, or a little bit tighter than the exact desired line. When it runs a bit wider, then that's what we call understeer, when the car sort of pushes on, runs wider. And I've explained that here, so the green line is the perfect sort of neutral line, and the black is what the car is actually going to do, which is describe a wider arc than that ideal neutral line. So here's how it looks with the circle of traction. So I'm going to increase the size of the car there and we're going to put four circles of traction to represent one at each wheel. I'm going to remove the cards to clean up the diagram. Now at the back here um, we have the vehicle deaccelerating. You can see the small red uh, lines there to indicate that we're using some of the tyres grip for deceleration and same at the front also decelerating. Now at the back the we're also using some of the tyre grip for turning, not very much at the back, and therefore that black arrow resolves to a grip level which is less than the, the a grip demand, which is less than the available grip level. So therefore we're not skidding at the back. Now at the front, however, the tyres, the steering wheels are turned quite a long way, and that is demanding a high level of grip 
from the tyre which simply isn't able to, to uh, supply it. Hence the black arrow here is well outside of the grip limits and when that happens the car is unable to describe the required arc. It does describe an arc, it will turn a, a bit but it won't describe the arc um, the driver needs and we call that understeering because it's running wide. Now I've drawn the diagram here showing understeer um, whilst braking but you can also get understeer whilst accelerating as well and it's fairly e easy to do because um, as you accelerate you will get a weight shift towards the back which will make the traction at the back uh, greater, increase the size of the traction circle and reduce it at the front and then if you start to turn then that can overwhelm the grip of the front wheel. So the traction circle is beautiful, it tends to explain pretty much every dy dynamic driving situation. Okay and now we've got power on oversteer, there's lift off oversteer which I'll get to later on. So here we've got the car, it's going to go around a circle but this time um, it's actually going to describe a tighter radius than the driver intends and that's what we call oversteer. Now in the videos that uh, you can see this is power on oversteer so we look at the front wheels, um, in a rear wheel drive car in this case we're not actually driving the front wheels so all we the only thing the front wheels have to do is brake and turn, they're not being braked so it's just turning here so the traction demand on the front wheels is actually quite small. Now the rear wheels have to do turning so we represent that with the um, yellow arrow here but the drivers have also given their rear wheel drive cars a massive amount of throttle input. Now that's represented by this green arrow here and as you can see that means that the black arrow the combination of the turning and the power resolves to a grip demand way outside the grip level available. So then all of a sudden we have lost traction on the rear wheels, we've still got traction on the front wheels and that is why the car rotates around into an oversteer or a drift um, situation and it's pretty obvious from the videos what's happening there and obviously the way to fix that would be to reduce the power and then the car will snap back into line. Why? Because um, you're then putting that black arrow back inside the traction circle or the other thing you could do is simply um, reduce a bit of power then also reduce the turning. Either way it's all about bringing um, that black arrow back inside that circle. Okay now there's a couple of simplifications um, which I've made so far I'm going to desimplify them now. One is I've talked about the limit of grip here being sharp. Well it's not sharp, it's not a case when you're driving you have grip and then instantly there's no grip. I mean that can happen if you've got a wide tyre on the wet or something like that but generally um, there is a transition period from more grip to less grip and it actually looks a bit like this. So if you just look at this blue circle here, you've got good grip, good grip, 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 and then it starts to fade away like that. And then the transition of a tyre from gripping to no gripping, that is an indication of how forgiving the car is. If you can get to the point where you can feel the car sliding and hear it and, and just generally get that sensation, then you can bring it back in, into the grip limits or within the traction circle. But if there's this really sudden transition from grip to no grip, well, that makes a car really hard to drive and unforgiving and you're possibly likely to end up in hospital. Okay, now this is what I mean about the transition. Now I could get more into this and talk about slip angles another time, but basically this is the lateral force applied to a tyre in G. Most um, reasonably high performance tyres can get up to around 1G lateral force. And then there's the slip angle there. Now the slip angle is the angle that the tyre is making relative to the direction of travel. And you can see there, once we get up to about sort of 4 or 5 degrees, that tends to be about maximal, and beyond that um, it starts to slip off. So that's your tyre grip level against force there and it's the fact that you can get up to here and this is where you want to be for maximum traction and once you get beyond that idealized slip angle you don't suddenly lose traction it just decreases again and that's how people who drift cars um, can manage to maintain that drift because they're operating in this area over here at a high slip angle um, but with less grip and that's also why a vehicle on bitumen which is drifting is um, slower than one which isn't drifting because you're actually operating in a lower grip area over here as opposed to a lower slip angle and a higher level of grip over here. Now dirt roads are a different situation, you actually do want to drift on that, I'm not going to go into that now, I might cover that another time.
And a circle of grip isn't actually static, it constantly changes. And there's two main ways it changes. One is the amount of weight on a vehicle's tyre, and the other is the nature of the surface. So basically, the more weight you put on a vehicle's tyre, the greater the grip you have, and conversely, the less weight, the less grip. And the surface massively changes, whether it's um, wet or dry or loose or mud or whatever else there. So basically, between the weight and the nature of the surface, the grip level is constantly changing for each tyre. And now that's not a problem if you're just driving around slowly on roads, but once you get into performance driving, be that in a four-wheel drive or on a race car or anything else, then grip levels become the, really the most important thing that you're driving to. So here we've got a car, it's at speed, it's on a racetrack, it's accelerating very um, slowly because it's, it's fairly, going fairly quickly and it's not turning. So you know, we're going to assume it's got a pretty much a 50-50 front wheel weight distribution and therefore each one of these circles we're just going to put them as equidistant. And by the way, the, it is not true that a um, front to rear weight distribution of 50-50 is perfect. I, we're going to get into that another time. Now, same car going around a left-hand bend here and there's a massive weight shift to the right-hand side of the car or the outside of the car. And so these two traction circles on the right hand side uh, will increase in size and the two on the inside, on the left in this case, massively reduce in size. Now the way physics works is that the increase in grip on the outside is less um, than the decrease in grip here, so you've actually got an overall net decrease in grip as a car goes around a corner compared to what a car is in a, a straight line. But nevertheless, that's the basics of how grip circles look when you're mid-corner. Now we've got a four-wheel drive here, and in the video you can see that the vehicle drives up a hill and then the front right wheel loses traction. Now why does it lose traction? Well the answer is there's very little weight on it and then you can see I've represented that here with a tiny little grip circle and of course the grip demand that the driver and the engine is putting through that tyre far exceeds the grip available which is why that tyre spins. Now where is the grip? Well it's actually with the rear right tyre, that's where the most of the grip is because the vehicle is going up here, you've got that weight shift to the rear and it's balancing on diagonal wheels which is why this circle here is nice and large and that one is um, a little, is, is smaller. So, and the front left has actually got quite a decent amount of grip as well because the vehicle is balanced on diagonal wheels. Now, shifting the grip, shifting the torque to where the grip is is a fundamental or four-wheel drive and you do that by picking the appropriate line and things like brake traction control as you'll see in this video here and things like cross axle differential locks can help you with that so you can see that understanding the traction circle really helps you to understand how to drive and also how traction aids work. Okay, now we're going to um, come down a hill in a Navara this time and you look at the front left hand wheel and you see that lock up and then unlock again and that's the electronic hill descent system. Noticing that the front left wheel is actually starting to rotate slower than the others and momentarily releasing the brake pressure. And the reason it does that, you don't want, that, you don't want those wheels to lock up and skid because if you do that, well that's probably going to end in tears or an insurance claim or something like, like that, really not, not ideal. And again, coming downhill, we've got that weight shift to the front. That's why I've drawn these two circles larger. And there's a little bit more weight generally on the left wheel than the, uh, uh, on the right wheel there is on the left wheel, which is why this circle is bigger um, than that circle. All right, and now coming uphill, same sort of thing again. We've got a weight shift right towards the back of the vehicle, so these circles are larger than the ones at the front. And if you look at the video right at the top, you'll see that all four wheels spin because the vehicle's bellied out, and then all four of these traction circles suddenly become very, very small indeed. So we talked before about power on oversteer. Now there's another type of oversteer called lift off oversteer. What's happening here is I'm driving a race car, it's a third gear corner, and it's a downhill to the right. Now when we go downhill we get a weight shift to the front and that is one reason why the traction circles at the front of the car have been drawn larger than at the rear of the car. The second reason is of course braking. Braking hard and that means that you're going to get a weight shift from the back of the car to the front and that's why these traction circles at the back are so small. Now exaggerated to that, this is a front wheel drive uh, race car and there's not a lot of weight in the back anyway so the weight distribution is actually quite um, far forwards and you combine 
combine all of that together and you get these tiny little traction circles at the back and very large ones at the front. That means that because there's more weight on the front, the traction circle is bigger, there's more grip, and when you turn in, despite the fact that the front wheels have to do turning as well as gripping and, and driving, etc., there's actually plenty of grip for them to be able to do that. But the lateral force required on the rear of the car is greater than the grip available as shown by these small traction circles here and as a result the back of the car breaks free it starts to skid and therefore you enter that oversteer situation even though the car is front drive and it has absolutely no power going to the rear wheels at all. Now this can also happen with a rear drive car so for example actually at the same racetrack but a different car different day this time it's wet coming into a third gear corner to the left and I'm lifting off the throttle that has a weight shift from the back to the front increasing the grip at the front reducing the grip at the rear and that has um, enabled the back to just slide out a little bit requiring a counter steer movement as well. So how much of the circular traction can you actually use? Well, it may not actually be a circle. It's more likely to be an ellipse. So for example, you might have more grip available for braking and accelerating than you do for turning left and right. But it really depends on the nature of the tire. Now, whichever sort of tire you have, you might be able to use all of that grip all of the time. So let's say, for example, that you're on a dry road in your third gear. If you put your foot to the floor, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to use all of the tire's grip for accelerating. And that's shown here. You can see that there's the total amount of tire grip, but I've only drawn it to this point there because that's as much grip as you're going to be able to use. Now, for braking, your average vehicle can pretty much generally brake using all of the grip available. So that works and obviously you can just corner to any degree that you like and then use up all of the available um, traction there. Now you also might get for example the um, acceleration limit closer to the actual grip limit and that's not necessarily just a function of power that's just the ratio between the traction of the surface and the power of the vehicle so you might have a low powered vehicle on ice for example it can always manage to wheel spin even in fourth gear or you might have a high powered vehicle on a very sticky surface and it can't really wheel spin uh, much beyond I don't know second or, or third gear so there's three things to summarise about this model. The first is that it's, it is a model, it is not absolutely perfect, but it is still very, very useful for understanding vehicle dynamics and grip, and that's really the fundamental about how cars actually work. And then um, traction, it's constantly changing. As soon as a vehicle starts moving, there is a weight shift, front, back, forwards, left, right, and that changes the grip. And of course, the grip level is never the same meter to meter, even though you think it is even on a racetrack, there's, there's different levels of grip, um, slightly one side or the other side, and that's even more true um, of off-roading. So fundamentally then, what you've got to do is drive according to that grip level, and you can help yourself to understand the grip level by understanding the traction circle. Now this video is just going to be one of a few I'm going to do around this. I'm going to go into oversteer and understeer recovery using these concepts, so please stick around for that. Hope you found it useful. Please like, subscribe, share, etc. Any questions, drop them in the comments, and thank you for watching.